There is workplace tumult in a variety of industries all across the country. First, negotiations are expected to resume today in the strike by the 145,000 member United Auto Workers against General Motors, Ford, and Stellantis. Only 13,000 have stopped work so far. They staged select walkouts at plants in Missouri, Michigan, and Ohio with threats of more to follow. It's the first time in UAW history that it has struck all three of America's unionized automakers at once. As CNN reports, the companies offered to raise hourly wages as much as 20 percent over the four-year contracts, which would have taken the senior-most workers to a base pay of more than $80,000 a year, not including overtime or profit-sharing bonuses. But the union is demanding 40 percent during the life of the contract and seeks to reverse concessions that it made back when GM and Chrysler faced bankruptcy and needed federal bailouts in order to survive. The highest paid of the big three CEOs, GM Mary Barra, made $29 million last year. That's 362 times the median worker's paycheck. The other two had similarly proportioned compensation. By comparison, in 1965, CEOs typically earned just 20 times the typical workers' pay in their industries, according to the Economic Policy Institute. President Biden has voiced his support for the union. Directed profits have not been shared fairly, in my view, with those workers. Workers deserve a fair share of the benefits they help create for an enterprise. The bottom line is that auto workers help create America's middle class. They deserve a contract that sustains them in the middle class. Meanwhile, the Writers Guild of America has been on strike since May, joined in July by the Actors Guild. It's the first time that they've joined forces on the picket line since 1960. Both unions contend that their pay has gone down dramatically, while corporate profits and CEO compensation have boomed. The strikes have brought production of film and TV in America to a near standstill. But a poll last month showed that 67 percent of Americans supported the strikes. This week, TV hosts Drew Barrymore and Bill Maher announced they're going to start making shows without writers. In other fields, more than 60,000 health care workers in California, Oregon, and Washington just voted to authorize strikes against Kaiser Permanente, one of the largest nonprofit health plans in America, if no agreement is reached by the end of the month. The workers say that pay has not kept pace with inflation and that understaffing has led to long wait times and neglect of patients. Last month, the 24,000 American Airlines flight attendants voted almost unanimously to authorize a strike if their contract demands are not met. And in August, 340,000 UPS drivers who had threatened to walk out scored a big contract gain. Labor unions are enjoying a resurgence in popularity with the public. Gallup recently found that 68 percent of Americans approve of labor unions. That's the highest number since 1965. But with income inequality growing, there's a question as to their effectiveness. And while all this activity has increased awareness of union activity, the number of unionized workers in America has been on the decline for decades. Joining me now to talk about this is Scott Galloway, Professor G, the host of a great podcast and someone who has strong opinions about this subject. Scott, so you heard me sketch out the fine points of this. Union membership is in decline at a time when their, population, their popularity is growing. How do you see it? Are they the most effective means of dealing with these crises? Uh, good to be with you, Michael. You know, something I think every young professional needs to understand, and that is the, the distinction between being right and being effective. And I think it would be hard to argue that the union's intentions to restore dignity to the American worker and have a fair living wage, it'd be hard to argue they aren't right. But the bottom line is they haven't been effective. Uh, union membership's been cut in half of the 47 Western nations that have unions. 46 have seen union membership decline. It used to be one in three workers in the U.S., uh, now it's one in 10. In the auto industry, it's gone from 60% to 16%. So there's just no getting around it. The unions have been an ineffective construct. And despite the headlines of 330 Starbucks stores unionizing, not one of those 330 unionized stores has resulted in a collective bargaining agreement. In other words, it makes for a great headline, but the people on the front lines haven't seen their compensation move. So I would argue that unions quite frankly, are a failed construct. Their intentions are noble and people support their intentions. But as a vehicle for registering or recognizing that those intentions, they just haven't worked.
So what's the alternative? I have a poll question today that asks, what's the best mechanism for protecting the working class? And the choices that I offer are the federal government, the free market, and labor unions. Well, the free market, uh, I mean, market dynamics will always trump individual performance. But when you just have let the market take over, which the entrenched incumbents and corporations will urge, you end up with households where one in five uh, households with children are in poverty. You end up with people living in their cars. You end up with child labor. So the marketplace uh, is a key force here, but it's not enough. There are two former UAW presidents in prison because of corruption. There are thousands of unions. They don't coordinate. They're not effective. There should be one union in the United States, and it should be the federal government. And we should take minimum wage, and I'll propose this, from $7.25 to where it would be if it had just been uh, scaling or tracking productivity, somewhere around $23 or $25. Michael, can you think of any one move the federal government could make that would reduce childhood poverty, obesity, blood pressure, suicide, male abandonment, diabetes, poverty, homelessness, than raising the minimum wage. And the incumbents will argue that this would damage the economy. And what we have seen in studies out of Berkeley and UC Riverside is that when you raise the minimum wage, as they did in California, New York, and Washington, you not only don't lose jobs, you gain employment and the economy grows. Because the wonderful thing about lower and middle income households is that when you give them additional money, they spend it. So since 2009, the NASDAQ's up sixfold, CEO pay is up threefold and minimum wage is stuck at $7.25 an hour. There should be one union. The head of that union is Biden, 20 to $25 federally mandated minimum wage. You know that there are some businesses that are on the margin and they say that if there were a federally mandated minimum wage, we wouldn't survive. Would it be worth it if some washed out in the long term? That's exactly the right question. So there's no free lunch. McDonald's stock would go down. Walmart stock would be pressured. A lot of restaurants would go out of business. And you know what, Michael, it'd be worth it. It'd be worth it. And I think that the additional income, the thing that is creating a soft landing in our economy is the additional or the remnant stimulant payments being spent by lower and middle income households. These are the engines of the economy. And it comes down to this, what kind of nation do we want to live in? Do we want to live in a nation where the child income tax credit gets stripped out of the infrastructure bill, where the average 70-year-old is 72% wealthier than he or she was 40 years ago, and the person under the age of 40 is 24% less wealthy. Minimum wage impacts lower and middle income households and younger people who have all been on the wrong side of the economy. Of the hundred, of every $100 increase in wealth over the last 10 years, 50 cents of that $100 has gone to the bottom half of Americans. There's always a tension between capital and labor but over the last 40 years, capital has beating the crap out of labor, and it has resulted in deaths of despair skyrocketing. There is, this is, this is the, most, the, mo the wealthiest nation in the world should be paying people a living wage. The intentions here are correct. The construct is ineffective unions. One union, the federal government, a massive increase in minimum wage. Okay, I know how you're voting on today's poll question. A final subject. I tried to give the lay of the land during the introduction of the segment. Would you compare and contrast what's going on with the writers and the actors with this situation involving the UAW? The strikes come down to the effectiveness and when they're going to end come down to one of three things. One, the health of the industry, two, the leverage the workers have and their demands. So let's go by each. UPS, 20% uh, increase in package delivery. The auto industry is very healthy, record profits at GM and Stellantis. And then the media industry, talking about the writer strike, Disney's at a 10-year low, their stock price. Viacom's off 75%. The number of uh, households with cable have gone from 87% to 47%. So they struck at absolutely the wrong time. And then let's talk about the demands. The UAW just wants to restore their starting wage to where it would be with inflation. The Teamsters demanded a raise of $2.75 in air conditioning for their drivers. And then the Writers Guild is asking for a pause in technology and uh, minimum writers. That would be tantamount to the Teamsters asking UPS to not do any research on automated driving or demand two drivers uh, per van. So we saw the Teamsters strike get settled. I believe the UAW will settle. I think their demands are reasonable and the auto industry has huge, huge incentive. And the, the key question, the reason why the writers strike 
uh, the writer's guild will probably be broken. And we're seeing the beginning of the end already. We're seeing cracks in that strike. There's one question, and I'll pose it to you, Michael. If you go to an auto lot in a month, you're not going to have cars. You feel it the next day when UPS isn't delivering things. If you didn't know there was a writer's strike, would you know there's a writer's strike? They have no leverage. It's a great point. 